Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to our second talk of the series in fall semester. So again, in case there are some new audience here, uh, this talk series will be given by uh, the award awardees of NCU Delta Young Astronomer Lectureship, uh, which was founded by the National Central University and uh, the Delta Electronics Foundation to recognize young scholars who have made outstanding contributions in this field. So each year, the awardee will be invited to Taiwan to interact with the local astronomers and the public. So the first award was given in 2012, and uh, the original plan for this year was to invite all the previous awardees to come back to Taiwan. But uh, unfortunately, we have to make this event online due to the pandemic. So our speaker today is Professor Liu Jifeng from NAOC. So it's our great pleasure to have him here. So I think Professor Liu received this award in 2016, and he's now the deputy director of NAOC. And I think he's a world expert in using multi-wavelength facilities to study the stars and compact objects. So for example, he has made great contributions in black hole observations, such as measuring the black hole mass in ultraluminous X-ray source. So um, today he's going to share with us a very exciting and uh, ambitious project called uh, Sitian. So which in Chinese, I think it means sky monitoring. And so just a few announcements before we start, please mute yourself during the talk and if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the chat box anytime you want. Uh, we will come back to those questions in the middle of the talk or uh, during the Q&A session after the talk. All right, uh, Jifeng, I will let you take this away if you are ready. Yep. Uh, thank you, Professor Pan. I'll uh, start my talk. My talk, Sutian project for the transcend universe. Of course, this talk is on behalf of our whole CTM consortium. So the universe, if we look at a universe in a static way, you know, you, you, you see our earth, you see our sun, you see all the stars, you know, uh, and the Milky Way and a lot of uh, Milky Way like, uh, you know, spark galaxies and elliptical galaxies, galaxies, and then you see the, you know, uh, the whole structure of the universe. I mean, in some sense, is a hierarchical structured universe. But then, on the other hand, you know, the universe is transcendent in nature because every, you know, heavenly body, you know, every star actually is ever changing. It's not like in Chinese you call it a hansing, but it's not constant star. It's ever changing star, right? So it's transient in nature, not only stars, but a lot of other objects. I mean, if you look at the picture you know, uh, to the right, we actually, you know, uh, here, we actually, uh, you know, list, uh, okay, I'll just move this, uh, okay. You know, it's blocking my heavy vision. <laughs> okay, so if you look at uh, the figure to the right, you see a lot of uh, variable objects like a supernova, you know, all kinds of supernova and uh, like uh, kilonova, you know, from uh, the merging of uh, neutron stars. And then, you know, you have gamma ray burst after close, you know, a, a lot of things. Uh, well, I mean, when we talk about transients, you know, we talk about uh, the duration of uh, the transients, you know, the time scale, uh, it's a characteristic time scale. I mean, here you can see, you know, the characteristic time scale actually ranging from, uh, say, uh, you know, the right actually is years to months to days, and then to, you know, a tens of days, or so even to, you know, minutes or seconds. But then what's the cap our capability now? I mean, you see this, uh, you know, vertical bar, you know, to the left actually is less than a day. It's a rarely explored space. Uh, to the right, you know, above a day, the time scale is uh, well explored. But then, you know, uh, for, for example, the supernova, it's uh, well explored, but the early stages are not well uh, explored. So, well, I mean, you know, all these studies, you know, we have uh, learned a lot. For example, uh, you know, the 
the ERM counterpart for gravitational wave events. I mean, here shows the example for GW170819. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, LIGO actually, LIGO and Virgo actually detect the, the merging events. You, you know, uh, soon on you have uh, a gamma ray and X-ray detection. And then later on, you know, actually it's uh, like, uh, you know, uh, 11 hours later, the SWOPE telescope, one meter telescope actually identified the optical counterpart. Uh, and then after another half a day, you know, we actually obtain this optical spectra of this one. If you look at the light curve, you know, from all wavelengths, and it, uh, you actually see this, you know, rising and declining ship, it's actually consistent with the kilonova model. You know, this model uh, depicts like two neutron stars collision, you know, into each other. And then, you know, it, it uh, uh, you know, the, the materials get split out. And then because of the, uh, you know, great energy it contains, it actually, you know, very soon it becomes a fireball, you know, it just expanding. And basically what we observed for this event, actually this is this fireball. And of course you actually see these, you know, uh, absorption lines and you say, okay, that actually means, you know, high opacity. And that's evidence for, you know, dense nights, you know, this heavy metals. So when this event happened, you know, people actually, you, you see in the news, you know, uh, you know, gold actually produced, you know, from neutron star merging, you know, they are actually based on this, you know, uh, uh, observation, you know, saying it has, you know, heavy elements in this explosion. Uh, but then, you know, to tell the truth, this is actually a feat for, you know, transient study. You know, you actually catch this optical counterpart, you know, uh, you know only half a day later, right? But it's, on, it's also a pity because now, you know, we actually don't have the power to discriminate between different equation of state models. You know, that's actually very crucial, you know, very useful, significant. I mean, if you look at a figure uh, you know, to the lower right, you actually see the red curve and the blue curve. You know, the red curve is the usual, you know, neutron star, you know, equation of state model. You know, the blue curve is another, you know, kind of exotic, but uh, some theorists actually say, you know, they have value in it. And in this case, the blue curve actually it seems like it fits the observations better, you know, in the late on stage. But the biggest difference between these two models actually lies in the first four five hours of this collision. But of course, I mean, you know, current uh, you know uh, uh, time domain machines actually didn't uh, you know have the capacity, have the capability to catch this. Uh, uh, five-hour early light curve. You know, another example I want to mention actually is the supernova cosmology. You know, the top one a supernova. We know they are you know uh, uh, standard you know standardized candles to measure the distance. If you if you look at the light curves of you know different one a's, they are very different. But if you you know, apply this stretch factor, you find that uh, you know the, the scatter of the peak luminosity actually is uh, rather small. So that's why it can be used as a standard standardized candle to measure the distance. So you know, people actually use one A as this to measure the expansion of the universe. This you know, Rysano, you know, uh, they actually you know did it like uh, more than twenty years ago. So what, what they found actually is, uh, you know, the supernova actually a dimmer than is in a universe of pure matter. So the acceleration, the expansion is accelerated, you know. So that means, you know, it has something weird. You know, what now we know is called, uh, we call it uh, dark energy. So, well, of course, they won the Nobel Prize. But then if you look at the data sets, 
you know, it, it has a lot of a large uncertainties. I mean, the reason for that is one A, you know, uh, supernova one A is the, a candle. It actually, is a heterogeneous class. You know, it, the, its progenitor could be a single degenerate model or double degenerate double degenerate model. A single degenerate model means you have a white dwarf. But then you have a companion star, either it's a red giant here, you know, like I show, you know, one solid mass red giant, or main sequence star, you know, large mass, six solid mass, or a smaller two solid mass main sequence star. Uh, that's single degenerate scenarios. Then, you know, it can be a double degenerate, you know, two white dwarfs, they just spar in and, you know, collide into each other and explode as 1A. Of course, I mean, Different mechanisms, you know, they, their lactose are bound to be very different. But here, I mean, in their work, you know, they didn't differentiate it between different models. That's, you know, that could be the reason why it's scattered a lot. You know, one way out actually is you actually examine the early light curve of these uh, 1As and try to tell whether they uh, single degenerate or double degenerate, and then you use you know uh, uh, one A's from this from similar progenitor, and then of course you will have a smaller uncertainty, right? So basically, what we see actually is uh, the time domain astronomy has achieved a lot, but then there's still you know some pities because it cannot go into very short time scale transcends. Uh, not to say, you know, and it cannot catch the very early, you know, light curves or explosion, explosive events. So basically, we need to do better, you know, with uh, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, sky surveys. You know, here I list, uh, you know, the current and the planet sky surveys. You know, some sky surveys like ASASI, you know, all sky automated survey for supernova. And like GWARC, ground-based wide-angle camera, you know, they are rather small aperture and a very shallow, you know, detection limit. So we're not talking about those. We're talking about, uh, you know, the, the service with large telescope and the very, you know, deep detection limit. Uh, well, I mean, here I list like uh, uh, Sutian is our, you know, project. You know, uh, try to you know, we're, we're pushing pushing it uh, uh, to say 2025 or maybe later and then RSST, uh, RSST it has been you know for a while for like 22 decades and it's going to be commissioned very soon and then this manifesto you know it, it's a 1.6 meter in the skies with three color cameras uh, it, it's, it's going to be, you know, next year or year after. And then, we you know, Pastor, uh, you know, it's you know, a decade ago, you know, at Hawaii, and then Sky Mapper in Australia, you know, it, it has been there, you know, for a while. And then that's a WFST is a 2.5 meter telescope uh, to be installed uh, at a Lenghu site and uh, next year or later. And then that's the Zuki transient factory. If you look at uh, this table, you notice that uh, you know their aperture, of course, is uh, larger than one meter, and most of them are just one telescope. The detection limit ranging from say you know below twenty magnitude to you know twenty five magnitude per exposure, and uh, it's out. It's a field of view, you know, ranging from one degree to, you know, say a stunting, you know, 47 square degree for ZTF. Yeah. And the most of it, you know, try to cover the whole sky. When, when we say whole sky, you know, you know that means, uh, you know, for one night, it's just, uh, it's, yeah, well, the whole night for a telescope is a 10,000 square degree. But then because, you know, the Earth is rotating, so mostly it's something like, uh, you know, it, it can be double, you know, like uh, 20,000 square degree. And then the cadence, the cadence is the key um, for the, 
you know, for the early stages of explosive events or short events. Here you can see, except for CTM, most of them, the cadence actually longer than two days, right? And these, of course, are not good for faster transients or early likers you know, within days you know, for these explosive events. Well, I mean, I, here I show two you know, time domain state of art facilities. You know, one is a Zuiki transient factory, is a 1.2 meter after you know, modified Schmidt. Uh, you know, FOV is 47 square degree. It's kind of uh, striking. And, uh, you know, the renovation, you know, uh, the, reno re the renovation cost like uh, uh, $30 million. That's uh, approximately 200 million you know, renminbi yuan. And this, this actually is, uh, you know, it is the time domain machine for now. It, it actually, in operation, it discovers hundreds of thousands of transients every night. You know, it's not discovering too, too few, it's discovering too many. So, I mean, because when you are given hundreds of thousands of transients, I mean, you just don't know what to do. So what they do actually is try to do a very rough classification based on PSF ship, like a galaxy association and ascending trend, et cetera. I mean, but then even that, you know, it gives you a only rough classification. That means for supernova, you have a lot of supernova. Variable stars, you have a lot of variable stars. You don't know which one actually is of interest. So you have to, I mean, sometimes you have to pick one of them to do follow up and see what it is. I mean, you will miss a lot of uh, you know, things of interest. I mean, if you want to observe all of them, that's not possible because even the whole world actually lacks the spectral capacity to follow up all of them. And then that's RSST, the Large Synoptic uh, Serial Telescope. And it has an aperture of uh, 8.4 meter. And then even such large aperture, it still have a very amazing, ma amazingly large field of view of uh, 10 square degree. But then, you know, for a large telescope to have a large you know, uh, field of view, I mean, the optical design, it actually introduced a lot of blocking. So uh, like in this RSST case, so it's real aperture is equivalent, to, effective aperture is equivalent to 6.7 meter. And even with a seven meter aperture, you know, the detection limit is a 25 magnitude per exposure per scan. I mean, this is actually very amazing. I mean, but then, you know, sometimes it just cause confusion problem. But anyway, this is, uh, you know, the machine you know, will be in operation soon. And the cost is very dearly, you know, it's uh, 750 million you know, dollars. That actually means, you know, 4.8 billion, that may be UN. Well, so that's the part. What is next? I think the next actually is trying to explore, you know, very deep, and yet you want to have very short time scale cadence, right? But the currently, you know, when you go deeper than 20 magnitude, you find we actually lack the capability to catch the transients shorter than days. And it is hard to catch the early light curves for transient lasting months. They last a month, but the early, the early light curves of a few days is very hard to catch. You know, but a lot of things like a supernova, like a tidally disrupted events, like a gamma ray burst of glows, uh, all like this. It's harder to catch their early light curves. And well, I mean, like, we said when we, you know, talk about uh, Zuiki Transcendent Factory. I mean, an another difficulty actually lies, you know, actually lies in how to identify precisely, you know, the object of interest within hours. I mean, because you really need the very f the first few hours to uh, get their spectra, you know, uh, to arrange follow up. Uh, well, I mean. Most of them, they don't have the power because they lack the information, right? 
uh, because within ours, they only have a few uh, data points. So basically, I think the, uh, the way out, the next step actually is we need to survey the whole sky at a cadence of ours, right? Well, but how? I mean, because if you want to use a single telescope with a large FOV, you know, ZDF has already pushing the limit, you know, it's, and it has touched the ceiling. I mean, so, and it's still, it cannot solve the problem. So I think that the solution is not a single telescope. It must be an array of telescopes. So that's what our CTN actually is doing. So the core concept of CTN actually is trying to, a few words. It's, first of all, it's an array of telescopes. And then it's try to survey the whole sky. The whole sky meaning the 10,000 square degree above your head. It's 30 degrees you know, above the horizon. So that means you know, above 30 degrees elevation angle. And another word actually is about within 30 minutes in three colors. Well, in three colors means you can actually remove false positives. I mean, if you only use one color, you see something something change changes, but it may be false positive. But if you actually see the change in three colors simultaneously, well, that means it's not false positive, it's real, right? So three colors will help you to remove false positives. And also if you have three colors, you can obtain physical properties, you know, uh, uh, real time. And a lot of uh, like uh, temperature, like, uh, you know, whether it's a star, whether it's a galaxy, you know, uh, actually you can, when you have uh, in 30 minutes, you already have such information. And also, you know, very important actually is you actually can have a very precise, you know, classification within say two hours, because in two hours, you will have 12 data points. 12 data points for the object. I mean, that's enough information to actually make a, you know, a classification. So that means, you know, within, within hours, you'll know what it is, whether it's of interest or it's just the mediocre objects. If it's of interest, then you can use your precious, your precious resource of a spectroscope, you know, of a spectral telescope to do the spectral follow-up. And in other words, actually, is to a depth of 21 magnitude per exposure. This is to try to survey enough cosmic volumes. I mean, not like uh, Assassin or, or GWARC, they only you know, look at nearby galaxies or very bright things you know, far away. But if you do a 21 magnitude you know, per exposure, you actually survey enough cosmic volume so that you can have enough events of a supernova, TDE, or gamma ray burst, you know, afterglows. And especially, I mean, we say 21 magnitude, you know, we combine all these requirements because we really want uh, several, several GW, you know, 17, 08, 19 like events. That is, we really want to catch at least one, you know, neutron star merger, you know, every year. <clears throat> So that's the core concept. I mean, then, you know, how to realize this concept, you know, one way out. I mean, I'm talking about one solution, you know, we can have other solutions, but this solution, we are actually, you know, working on it and we already have prototypes. I mean, for this realization, a single telescope is a 1.2 meter modified Schmidt like ZTF, but it's FOV, it's a 25 square degree, it's just the half of ZTF, but we're not pushing the limit of technology. And the camera is to try to match this you know, field of view. It's a mosaic camera. Uh, you know, currently it's a full non-K by non-K CMOS, you know, chips. You know, uh, you... And then, you know, this single telescope, we try to make one unit of three telescopes. Three telescopes, very similar, but with different filters. I mean, the Field of view actually is a 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter. The, the, the focal plan is a 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter. It's huge. So you, you want to use a fixed filter 
You cannot use a filter, a filter wheel to change the filter. You have to fix it you know, before the focal plane. And then these three similar telescopes with different filters, they will point to the same sky. They survey the same targets. And this one, given this aperture, a, a, a one minute exposure will go as deep as 21 mag or deeper. And then after, uh, after a minute, you just move among adjacent fields, right? It's uh, adjacent fields, so the slowing time is short. Well, this one unit in half an hour will go through at least 25 adjacent fields. I mean, that's, uh, we know this because, you know, current months, months of the telescope actually is the fast slowing ones. So within half an hour, you will have a total field of view is a 625 square degree. That means if you want to cover 10,000 square degree, you know, you only need 16 units of uh, three telescopes. So here comes our realization. We have a major array installed in units instead of system because we want redundancy, right? If someone actually go malfunctional, you 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 can use another telescope to you know, uh, to replace it. So that means 40, 40, you know, 54, you know, 1.2 uh, meter telescopes. Wow. Well, if you have such a major array. You, you would expect huge amount of data. Actually, the raw data will be 30 terabytes per night, 10 terabytes per year. If you count you know, the intermediate you know, data because you're trying to reduce them, you, you, you actually combine them, you, know, you do a lot of things onto them. And then you also want to back up. So you will be faced with 30 terabytes per year. This is a huge amount of data. You know, if uh, 20 years ago, people will be scared about this kind of data, but to say today, I mean, it's just, it's just okay. I mean, you know, if you go to any big data in the company, they can deal with such data, you know, uh, easily. And then you have this major array, you want to do some real-time control. You want to do, you know, fast reduction of the data, the full sky data within half an hour because half an hour later you will go back to the same targets. You want it to be reduced and analyzed already. And then you want to do fast identification of transients of interest, you know, try to pick up the one of interest from uh, millions of uh, transients. And then you also want to, you know, given these targets of interest, you want to command spectral follow-up observations. And also you really want flexibility in observation modes. For example, if you find some you know, transients of interest, you want to do consecutive exposures instead of uh, you know, every one, expo you know, one exposure every 30 minutes, right? And also when you find one really interesting targets, you want to use uh, all as one, mode, point all your telescopes to their the direction. And in that case, you know, you will have roughly a seven meter telescope, uh, uh, you know, equivalence. And because, you know, the collecting area of all these uh, 54 telescopes, you know, is kind of equivalent to LSST. That's, you know, uh, well, that said, you know, we really need is a AI brain to handle all these data, network, follow-up, et cetera. And well, you know, this is really good, but what about the cost? Well, we know ZTF is have a similar 1.2 modified Schmidt telescope, you know, 47 square degree. Its cost is uh, $30 million. And if by scaling, you know, our STEM you know, telescope 1.2 modified Schmidt is a 25 square degree and, uh, you know, half of the field of view. So the price, if you say, okay, half the price is still, you know, 15 million 
dollars. That's uh, essentially a hundred million yuan. Well, a major array, you know, 54 you know, such telescopes, that means 5 billion yuan. This is ridiculously expensive, you know. I mean, because uh, we know the, 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 the China you know, uh, Space Station Telescope is a two meter you know, telescope in a space. It's 5 billion, and, but it's in space. So if you want a 5 billion you know, for a uh, you know, major array, I mean, well, I mean, no one will fund, no, no one will give, give you money for that. So that's no wonder, you know, people think, you no, know, it, it good, it's good to develop such arrays, but no one else wants to do such an array. Well, it seems like it's really difficult to do such things, but what we did, I think what we achieved actually is for our first 1.2 meter prototype telescope, we already reduced the cost from 100 million yuan to 15 million yuan. That's just the first prototype. So our goal actually is when at a stage of bulk production, our goal actually is try to reduce the cost from 15 million to 12 million. I mean, it's doable because it's a bulk production. I mean. The cost actually is in the research part, you know, you, because you don't know how to do it. You, the optical design and all this uh, you know, new you know, production, so it costs money. But once when it comes to bulk production, the cost is uh, bound to be low. Twelve million actually is uh, you know con conservative uh, estimate. It, it can be like uh, ten million yuan. So in this sense, you know, this major array of 54 1.2 meter telescope array, you know, its budget is just, uh, you know, 0.65 billion instead of 5 billion. I mean, you know, this can, so, well, I mean, for this CTM project, we mentioned, uh, you know, follow-up telescopes. So uh, we were also, uh, uh, in addition to, this major array and uh, some, you know, units of uh, some you know, units in other places, uh, we will also try to build like, uh, you know, spectral telescopes, you know, two meter or four meter. You, you can add some something to the budget, but uh, the first stage, CTN, uh, the first phase of CTN will be completed, can be completed well below 1.5 billion. So that's 1.5 billion. You know, you uh, you know fast. A 500, 500 meter uh, in Guizhou province, uh, it actually cost 1.3 billion. So 1.5 billion, 1.3 billion. That's the magnitude, the funding magnitude for a national mega project. And uh, you know, uh, currently. We actually can do a CTN one, you know, uh, you know, at at such a magnitude. So the full picture, the full picture of CTN project, you know, we actually have this uh, one meter telescope arrays, you know, major arrays, and some actually you know, scattered in other sites, so that uh, you you can, uh, uh, if the major array, you know, get a cloudy weather. You know, somewhere else, you still can uh, look at uh, the sky, you know, it's part of the sky. So that's a one meter telescope array. You have this. And then you have telescopes for follow up. And then you have the CTM brain. That's the whole picture. The CTM brain, you know, can you know, do the strategic planning, you know, give alerts, you know, try to do the sky survey. And it also be responsible for data management. You know, you can do it uh, real time reduction. You know, you can you know, do also do the offline reduction. And this is the core of the CTM project. It also has a connection to outside facilities. For example, you know, for this survey telescope, for the photometric telescopes, you, you, you can uh, actually try to include other you know, standardized telescopes, either existing or newly built. And for the follow-up telescopes, you can use, you know, spectrograph worldwide, 
you know, like uh, you know, like even for you know the 10, 10 meter telescope like GTC, we actually have contract, you know, we have uh, agreement with them to use them. And also it has connections with, uh, you know, other surveys or observations like a space born observat observatories. Currently, you know, Einstein probe will be launched you know, the next year and also SWAN, another you know, you know, satellite will be launched you know, uh, next year too. And then you know, we can, they will give you alert from X-ray or gamma ray. And, and then there are other surveys like a ZTF, like a RSST, well, not RSST, it's you know, Southern Hemisphere. But there are other surveys that can give to interesting target CTM, you know, CTM product. And then there are modern messenger you know, alerts from LIGO, Virgo, or neutrino, or cosmic ray observations. So basically, this is the whole picture. It's, it's uh, uh, what do we want to do, actually, is uh, we, we are aiming at a national mega project at 2025, if not, then 2030. So we have a, a whole consortium trying to advance TM vigorously. And when we say we, we mean about you know, more than 100 researchers from uh, more than two dozen institutes and universities you know, in the mainland. And well, back in 2018, we had this first meeting. You know, we actually say we want to do this. And uh, that year we had this, uh, uh, preliminary white paper and uh, 2019 we get uh, two million you know startup fund from uh, uh, NLC and then and that also that year you know I actually uh, looked into the technology and the fund how to reduce the cost from a hundred million to 50 million That's what's going on. Uh -huh, okay. And then 2020, you know, we actually convened a meeting at a Lenghu, at a Lenghu town. You know, it's a, uh, here I showed, you know, showed a photo when, uh, when, when uh, we actually went to the Lenghu site. Uh, the elevation is uh, 4,200 meter. Uh, the local government actually chopped down the mountain top to a flat, you know, uh, uh, large area so that we can uh, install our Sutian array there. And also in 2020, we actually get funded by UCAS, University of Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences, uh, of uh, 15 million to for the first 1.2 meter prototype. And this year we got uh, another five million yuan from uh, Xizang University for a 70 centimeter telescope that will be installed at Ali site uh, in Ali Xizang. So here are the infrastru infrastructure as of now. Uh, well, uh, we have uh, you know, five you know, principal investigators, that's me and uh, Xue Feng Wu from uh, uh, Purple Mountain Observatory. And he's a deputy director of a PMO. And then Wu uh, Hong and Shang Zhaohui at uh, NOC. And also Professor Roberto Sorio from the uh, University of Chinese Academy of Science. And he actually is also our foreign affairs spokesman. And we have this uh, hardware working groups you know, for the optical design. You know, people, you know, Zheng Yang Li from uh, Nanyang Institute of Astronomical uh, Optical Technology actually is, uh, is the lead. And then for the camera, you know, uh, uh, Professor Jia Lei from uh, NOC is the lead. And we have uh, software working groups, you know, for telescope control is, uh, is uh, you know, Dr. Ge Liang from NOC. And then for CTM Brain, we have, uh, you know, Dr. Hu Yi, he actually, you know, works on the uh, the 50 centimeter you know, AST3 telescope uh, at uh, you know, at the you know Arct uh, Antarctic site. 
Uh, then for the data management is, uh, you know, Dr. Zhou Hu at NOC. And I also want to mention, you know, as of now, we begin to organize the working groups you know, to uh, prepare for the science cases. Uh, now we actually have this, uh, you know, uh, uh, preparation groups on black holes, on AI classifications, on supernovae, on you know, TDE, on variable stars, and on stellar activities. And of course, I mean, these working groups and the preparation groups are still expanding, and we actually welcome uh, you know, anyone who are interested. I, I, I think uh, you know, if anyone are interested in this, okay, I mean, you will find a place in our infrastructure. Then the prototype telescope, the 1.2 meter. So the 1.2 meter telescope is already get funded, get started. It's a primary mirror is being polished and the, it's a Schmidt plate is ready to polish. It's mount, is the horizontal mount is ready. And it, it's, uh, you know, as I said, the lead actually is uh, uh, Dr. Zheng Yang Li at, uh, at uh, Nanjing Institute of Astronomical Optic Telescope, uh, uh, Optical Technology. Then, then the, 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 the mosaic camera, it's a, you know, uh, it's a four Nanke by Nanke CMOS you know, chips. Uh, you know, currently we choose to use the uh, G-Sense CMOS chips, but uh, you know uh, that could be an alternative. You know, we'll you know we'll see at the end of this year whether we can use other you know uh, types. And then you know uh, this. You know, uh, Dr. Jiali at NOC is responsible for the mosaic camera and his group and his laboratory actually has uh, all the technology needed for this you know, camera and they have already you know, uh, manifested that in building other cameras. And also the, the dome for this 1.2 meter telescope will be ready in the spring at a single station so basically our plan is uh, the telescope will be commissioned in the fall. And another prototype actually is a three, three 30 centimeter unit. Uh, it's, uh, you know, this one is uh, because it's a 30 centimeter, it's a uh, field of view, it's a uh, small, it's a five square degree. So it has a field of view. And we're using a, a 6K by 6K CMOS camera for this one. Uh, this one actually is already installed at a Xinhua Observatory uh, back in August. Uh, the hardware and the software groups actually are testing the units and uh, at the same time, they are honing their skills so that they can do better for this 1.2 meter telescope. And the science groups, are preparing for surveys starting next September. That means next September, these are three 30 centimeter you know, telescopes you know, with different uh, filters will actually you know, uh, begin to survey the telescope. Uh, but of course, I mean, because the aperture is small, is a 30 centimeter. So uh, the detection limit is only 19 magnitude. And I also want to mention its connection with education. You know, this is team project, of course, it's a research project, but then it has very keen connection with education. Because, you know, first of all, you know, this CTM project will produce a color movie of the transcendent universe. And that actually is ideal, that material actually is ideal for public outreach. I mean, the students, the, the, the primary students, uh, the, uh, the high school students and the public, they will all be interested in this. And also this will be, this will produce abundant topics for scholarly research that can be conducted in universities and, uh, inst and the research institutes. So these materials are good for education. And at the same time, you know, the education can actually contribute to this project. For example, we already get a contribution from universities. You, like I mentioned, you know, UCAS actually contribute 
15 million yuan. It also contributed its labs, its students, and its faculty. And then Xizang University you know, contributed like 5 million and is contributing its students and junior faculty for this project. And we are also expecting, and not yet finished, or yet, uh, but we are expecting contributions from you know, planetarium and also from uh, uh, primary schools and high schools. And uh, for this uh, high school students, our consortium can provide supervision of their research. And if you want to do this, of course, you need to have uh, the standardized hardware and software so that it can be easily incorporated into the network. Currently, we have two you know, uh, standardized you know, hardware. You know, one is a 70 centimeter you know, telescope that Cezanne University actually you know, uh, tried to found. And uh, its FOV is a five degree by five degrees. And it is using 6K by 6K CMOS camera and it's at a price of five million. And then we also have a 50 centimeter telescope with three CMOS cameras. That means you can look at the sky simultaneously with the three colors. So collaboration, you know, international collaboration, worldwide collaboration is always a, is a driver, a strong driver for a, a big project like Sutian. So, I mean, for the first phase of Sutian, we will have one major array at Lenghu site, you know, in China, and have uh, other units in Mushtag, in, in Mushtag Mount, and also in Ali site in Xizang. Uh, but we will also have you know, uh, a few units across uh, the globe. And we already have MOUs you know, with uh, you know, Mexico, with uh, uh, MOUs with uh, you know, Spain, so that we can uh, put, uh, put our telescopes you know, at, in Mexico and uh, uh, in Spain, Canary Island, and also Ibrio uh, Peninsula uh, at uh, Harbor Lumber. And, and we also have you know, very good connection with uh, you know, uh, Chile, because there we have a South African Center for Astronomy of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. This center actually has run for a few years. And they actually recently they got a piece of land at uh, you know Van Tararus. Uh, there we can install you know, our uh, telescopes. And also we have a very close connection through BRICS, you know, magnetism this, uh, uh, with uh, South Africa. And, uh, you know, and also we are collaborating on this uh, BRICS wide, you know, integration, uh, you know, intelligent telescope and data network. This is a bit in project. And uh, through this project, we can actually install our telescope in Thousand. And also, we are you know, contacting uh, colleagues in Australia, trying to put some inside experience. Uh, essentially, you know, all these collaborations will not only provide potential sites, or we are not only looking for potential sites, we are all also looking for collaborations on how software research or student exchange. Uh, to summarize our product, Sutian product, you know, basically is a cosmic in the universe. And uh, we are expecting to, you know, we are, you know, to uh, make it you know, to, uh, a, a national you know, mega product uh, at uh, 2025. That's uh, five years later, very soon coming. If not, we will try. We will definitely push for 2030. So, uh, well, I mean, this project, a huge project for time domain science, and uh, you know, we will, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, we are trying our biggest effort, but we also, you know, welcome or we, we, you know, we actually embrace, you know, national and international collaborations. Okay, uh, thank you. Oh, oh, okay, last thing, you know, uh, now we actually have this, uh, you know, CTM uh, postdoc fellowship, you know, uh, you know at uh, NLC. Uh, if you, if someone actually interested in this position, you can contact me. You know, my email is like this. Uh, okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Professor Liu. So I think this is a very uh, exciting project indeed. So I think it's time for our Q and S Q and A session. So if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box, or you can just speak up directly to the speaker. So um, maybe let me. Uh, Wenping, you have questions? Yeah, Zifeng. Uh, this is Wenping. Mm -hmm. uh, my applaud and admiration of this ambitious project, just uh, congratulations to go this far. I do have some, uh, a, a couple of technical questions. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that you're going to incorporate a U band. So I wonder what is the scientific justification because the sensitivity will be lower there. And so the that would, somehow affect your exposure time. So if you try to synchronize the three telescopes together, and let me ask my second question together with this. I'm yeah. still don't, I still don't understand why don't you use some beam splitter to have a single telescope, but three detectors to have three band data rather than use three telescope. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chen. Uh, first of all, when I say UGI, you know, this is uh, just a pre preliminary design for three colors. I mean, you know, I mentioned you, I mentioned you because at Lenghu site and, and because it's high and also at Ali site is high. So you been mm. might have a good sense, you know, uh, might have a good sensitivity. But then, you know, it is true that we will do some, uh, some you know, uh, investigation and uh, do some uh, more careful calculation and see whether it is worth it. If not, then we can change to another filter. But all the, the, the essence actually is a three colors simultaneously, not just the two color, but a three colors simultaneously. And, and, and the second question, you know, about why why don't we use uh, you know a, a beam splitter? I mean, because the reason for this actually is because the the focal plan, you know, for this uh, five degree by five degree, you know, field of view actually is too large. It's a twenty centimeter by twenty centimeter. That's no, you know, that's no such beam splitters can do. Uh, usually, I mean, if you have a small field of view, a beam separator actually is very good. You know, like I mentioned, we have this, uh, you know, 50 centimeter telescope. It is using a beam separator to get three colors simultaneously, but it has a very small field of view. It, you know, well, actually it's a small focal plan. So beam separator actually works well there. But for, you know, uh, like, a, 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter focal plan, it doesn't work. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So I do have one question. So um, so you, I think you mentioned that uh, to, co to have a full sky coverage within 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, yes. so yes. you need like 54, I don't know, telescopes, uh, 16 yes. units. So I'm yes. just not sure about the location of these telescopes. I mean, when it just sounds like you spread all the telescopes around the world or something. No, no, so, no, no, we have a major two. array. Yeah, major array. Major the array. Same location. Major, yeah, the central location. 
at okay. the long side. You have all 54 one meter telescope there. And, uh, you know, uh, it has 18 units, you know, two units for redundancy. You know, okay. so all these units will point to a patch of the sky. You know, uh, so the slough, the slew actually is, uh, you know, uh, short, right? I mean, that's, that, that's the picture. Right. I mean, other than this major array of 54 telescopes, we can have a few units of uh, three telescopes and then in other sides, say if you, you, you put three units, that means none one meter telescope at, you know, at Ali side, you know, it, it, it can help you with uh, the weather, you know, because, you know, if uh, Langhu actually is cloudy, you actually get you know, three units actually working from Ali. Okay, so most of the telescopes will be in China, like. Uh... Uh, for the first phase, the major, yeah, you, well, phase. most, when you say most, that's the major array. So yeah. for the first phase, you know, you, you really want to test, you know, the technology, you know, test, uh, you know, the, the, the CTM brain, you know, whatever. So you, you have to, you know, face by face. For the first phase, it's most convenient to put it, uh, you know, in Leng, you know, at Lenghu site. But uh, another major array, you know, the second phase, will certainly put it uh, in Chile or somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so what about the, those four meter telescopes, uh, the spectroscopy facilities, they will also be in Lenghu? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, at least, well, I mean, you know, it depends on how many, you know. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, we are proposing to have at least a two four meter and uh, a lot more two meter. I mean, and then, you know, if you have two, at least one of the four meter will be put along with the major array, right? And uh, several, you know, two meter also along with the major array. Okay. But you are not only rely on this four meter telescope to classify, right? You maybe it's a worldwide. Well, so, right, right. So we're not. That, we're not. So another question would be: Is there like any plan to do the to release the alerts like immediate, like LSST will do? Well, we'll certainly do that. We'll certainly do that. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I mean because. Such array will produce, you know, let's say several, you know, tens of uh, millions of alerts, you know, every night, right? right? I mean, but 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 you know, that's no way that uh, you know our own network, you know, can actually observe or follow up all of them. You have to release them, you know, immediately. But of course, we will, you know, those will be released with, uh, you know, say. Uh, fast identification, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, 1A, you know, 1B, 1C, you know, very, uh, very precise ident identification because you have enough you know, data points within one night. Okay. Okay, thank you. By the way, I think uh, Yubin is, would be very helpful for, you know, for some kind, for some phenomena, I would say and at the very early times, of course. Right, yeah. right. That's why we, we put you there. I mean, that's some controversy about you because, you know, you know like a Sloan, you know, the u band of Sloan actually is not, uh, is not meeting the expectation. I mean, uh, but then, I mean, if you actually put it uh, at a very high elevation, you know, like uh, Lenghu or like Ali or like Mushtag, they are all above 4,000 meters above the sea level. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So any other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, this is oh. I, I just a quick question. Uh, okay. If, if it's high elevation, why don't you push to the radar band like, like VY? Uh, why don't you choose a radar band instead of a blue band? That's just a question. Why not uh, choosing radar bands? Yeah, yeah, like Z and Y. Like uh, uh, near infrared or something <clears throat> like Z and a Y band. 
You know, I, I must admit that uh, we haven't fixed, we haven't fixed, you know, the filters. I mean, you know, one, you know, it actually depends on, you know, the, 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 the sites, right? Depends on the sites. You know, another thing, it depends on, you know, the, the real testing of the optics and the camera. I mean, we are doing the first prototype uh, and it's not completed yet. You know, once it's get completed, we will work out the throughput, you know, the, the whole throughput, and then we'll see which filters are actually most sensitive. And then we'll combine that, you know, this with our science and then tr try to choose which filters to use. Maybe, you know, uh, UGR, you know the, the three of the UGRIZ, the Sloan filters, or maybe, you know, standard uh, uh, Johnson Cousin filters, or maybe some, you know, self-defined, you know, self-defined filters. You know, it's not done yet. You know, but uh, the essence, like I said, it's uh, three colors together. Okay. So, yeah, the basic idea is three colors, but maybe I think it could be flexible. It can be, you know, strategic, strategic. Like, you know, can, if you want to search for killer novi, you can do redder bands all together. And uh, do just Right. Uh, well, there could be some flexibility in the filters, and because we we have this redundancy, right? We have this right. uh, redundant telescopes. It can be, you know, different filters. You know. Okay. Great. Any other questions for our speaker? Hi. This is Wen Pin again. Um, again, this is just beautiful. Uh, I I hope. You will welcome a postdoc and, and also some senior members. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yes, of course, we welcome you all the time. <laughs> uh, I think um, it, I'm, I'm sure uh, you, you get a lot of feedback. I just wonder um, uh, you would have, well, you have just, I don't know, I, I don't think you can process all the data or process all your learning. It's just impossible. But I can imagine you will gear in, you will start with some you know, first level, most interesting event, right? Uh, that's uh, mm -hmm. that's break, breakthrough science. But I wonder mm -hmm. if you can afford one or, well, maybe even just one or two telescope and that would be equipped with a fish eye lens, but you do some polarization. So, uh, you know, uh, if, if there's some, there, some unit that finds some interesting event, that at least you have some all sky data, <laughs> fish eye images, and my favorite is polarization. And then, so in the, I, I agree with you. I think three color light curves just just beautiful. I think they have haven't been done before. Um, so so, and then plus one telescope, one camera, but do polarization. Please consider it. <laughs> well. You know, I think it's possible. You know, I think it's possible. I mean, why it is possible? Because we are trying to change the rules for building telescopes. I mean, meaning what? I mean, because when you're talking about a telescope with polarization, and then you talk about a, a telescope without polarization, you are, you are we you are weighing you are weighing between this one between these two, right? Because you are resources limited. You only got resources for polarization or without polarization. But here, if we can push it as a mega project, right? Then you got enough resources to add, you know, telescopes with polarization. So the, the, the key is, you know, trying to, trying to do some good things you know, before, before 2025. Once we got selected, you know, we actually have the freedom. <clears throat> we have the freedom, we have the luxury to add telescopes with polarization. Yes, I, I'm not advocating um, identical telescope, but doing polarization. I'm just talking about maybe one telescope, but 
it's capable yeah. of polarization. That would be extremely useful. That you know, you have already three colors. Adding polarization mm -hmm. adds to a additional but much expanded in parameter space in any model, right? So, uh, I, I yeah. agree. I agree. Yes, you know, we can even try that in the prototype of this. Mm. <clears throat> you, you know, I actually list you know a prototype uh, from Yuka another you know 70 centimeter from Cizang University and, and but to tell the truth I have several you know 70 centimeter you know prototypes in negotiation so you know pretty soon you know this year or next year we'll get money for uh, for other 70 centimeter telescopes we can actually put polarizer on those you know some of those mm. Uh, so, yeah. So, when can you have? Ian, I'm sorry. Uh, can I have one last? Question? Sure. Sure. <laughs> uh, Kivon, you know, uh, pen stars start mm -hmm. out with a panoramic sky survey, mm -hmm. and the rest of the alphabet it's rapid response system. So, in your talk, I heard about the sky survey, that's okay. But I also heard about you probably will also interrupt the survey with some rapid response, even to other uh, ZTF or LSST events, right? And, and that's not a simple task, even in the uh, telescope operation or project operating um, level. I wonder if, so, or have you have already thought about how you're going to do that? So, so I assume in the sky survey mode, all the 54 or whatever, 50 telescope are doing <laughs> up surveying the sky. Then how would you interrupt or partially or, or how? I just don't understand. Oh, by the way, mm -hmm. for PenStar. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh -huh. For Pinstar, that rapid response system never worked. They never uh, activate that mode, only to the sky survey, by the way. Work in progress. You know, the, the basic, it will be useful. And then is how, you know, we can realize that. I mean, uh, we actually, you know, uh, we have, uh, you know, several like uh, uh, technology groups, you know, uh, like uh, telescope control groups and uh, this uh, Sutian Brain groups. They are from, you know, one of them from uh, Xinlong Station, one, uh, one of them from this uh, Antarctic group. You know, they, they are operating remotely, this, uh, you know, 50 centimeter AST3 telescopes uh, uh, at, uh, you know, an Arctic uh, at a domain, uh, and uh, so these two groups they are discussing how to realize this. I mean, it, it, it's it, it actually you need to go deep into, you know, the telescope control, and to to realize this. I mean, you know, uh, wow, wow. Uh, that, that's as far as I can tell. I mean, the the gruesome details you know, uh, uh, actually are done by those uh, technology people. You, you can, when you visit, you can just talk with them. I mean, I, I just want them to do this. They say, okay, this is uh, doable, but then it depends on how fast you want to realize that, right? I mean, yeah. if you want to realize that like in seconds, it's, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, maybe it's not possible at all. But if you want to say, realize that in a few, Sec a few minutes. I mean, I don't think that's a problem. I mean, you know. No, I think I think my point is I think you are already with thirty minute cadence. You are already doing rapid response. So so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. So this project is is expected to start operation in twenty twenty five. I mean, this table here. Uh, well, you know, <clears throat> 2025 actually is the year, you know, 
uh, whether the mega per the national mega project can okay. be approved or not. But then, I mean, what we are doing now actually is trying to you know industrialize the production of telescopes. Uh, that means once you get the funding, you know, you get funding to build like 50 okay. telescopes, it can actually be achieved in two years. I mean, I mean, for now, for the industry now, it's not imaginable. I mean, how can you build like 50, you know, 50, one, even one meter telescope in two years? I mean, the whole world cannot do that. But to tell the truth, you know, I, I actually ask, you know, uh, industry uh, institute, you know, they are doing research to, uh, uh, they are trying to 3D print. Okay. 3D print telescopes. <laughs> you know, you just don't know. I mean, if you don't, don't reach out, you just don't know how fantastic they are. Right. Very interesting. Okay, okay. I'm just wondering if this project will this project will start after, I mean, the LSST complete the whole survey, or, or there will be some overlap. Yeah, yeah it's okay. a, the 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 we are trying to push it. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions from the audience? Right, I think it's about time. So, yeah, I think that's the end of today's talk. Thanks, thank you very much. Thanks again, uh, Jifeng. You know, for coming. You know, for staying with us, and you know, it's it's pretty late there uh, in Beijing as well. So, and uh, thanks again for all the audience for joining, joining us tonight. Us tonight. And uh, yeah, I think this is very uh, great talk indeed and very exciting uh, project. It's great to hear. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Chi Fong. I, I think we'll see you uh, in very near future, hopefully. All right. Thank you, thank you very much, Chi Fong. Bye-bye. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, bye.